Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Wild Ride with Steve-O. This one is a good one. We got a king of comedy. A guy who I relate to very intimately. And, uh, what else can I say, man? I'm really excited about this one. So. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Dunham. Yeah, dude. Thanks for having me. Ah, uh, dude, thanks for, for, for joining us. This is my co-host, Scott Randolph. How you doing? Hey, Scott. How's it going? Good. And wait, uh, what, wait, 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 wait. What's the one little rectangular tat? I see one little tiny rectangular this one? tat. Yeah, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's like a it's a blue square with a wave in the middle is it what, what does it mean anything no <laughs> i don't have any tattoos that mean show anything him, show really show him your pot leaf my pot leaf <laughs> he, i got he, a pot leaf he went to go get a palm tree and it just looks like a pot leaf yeah <laughs> <laughs> nice what else do i got Perfect. Oh, well, we'll talk about yeah, that they're, later. Yeah, they're, they're all pretty bad. My, <laughs> now, my dog, they're Wendy. They're all pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, my dog, Wendy, is sitting here. I think she knew that we were going to have you, and she wanted to look like a puppet. <laughs> <laughs> That's Steve's <laughs> doll. Normally, <laughs> normally she uh, lays down. Wendy, lay down. So, Steve-O, I missed the news the past few days. So, could you, I know all your viewers and listeners must know, but... So duct tape to the to the billboard is that what it was? It, it was that one. Uh, it, it's it's it was in August, so it's August. been a couple. It's, oh, been, it's, a, it's been a Sorry. couple months, but yeah. I had this really really provocative, crazy uh, adults only multimedia comedy special called Gnarly, which I distribute <laughs> direct to consumers streaming from my website, stevo.com, and I wanted to promote that. So I bought a billboard, duct taped myself to it, got all kinds of great press. But you know what, dude? It's such a great entry point to talk to you because, of course, Jeff Dunham, the, the, not only the world's most famous ventriloquist, but... Probably the only famous ventriloquist. <laughs> yeah, there's a good reason for that. <laughs> right, but now one night... Small union. One, yeah, one anyway. night, I was holed up in a hotel room on tour somewhere. And uh, it's not even usual for me to wa watch TV, but I turned on the TV and, and just sat there and watched an entire hour-long documentary about you. Oh, and, and Well, yeah, dude, it was fascinating. And I... I related so intimately to your struggle with trying to sell comedy specials. If I remember right from the documentary, I think you taped your own comedy special, but nobody would buy it. Is that well, right? I, yeah, what happened was it was back, this was back in 05, I guess. And I, I was in the comedy club uh, world and I was at the top of the food chain in that, but I couldn't get any higher. It was the glass ceiling, you know? Nobody would take me seriously beyond that selling out clubs all over the country, but no television. So nobody who wanted to be the executive that failed with the, the show about the ventriloquist. You know what <laughs> I mean? Nobody, nobody wanted to be that guy. So uh, nobody would give me a special, nothing. I'd get on, you know, eating at the improv and all those things. So um, my management at the time did one of those deals. And they said, look, uh, if Jeff films a special, will you, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this was after I'd filmed it. I filmed it. And uh, I, I paid for it myself. And back then, that was a lot of money. I think I spent 150 grand. It was mm. a, it was a lot of cash, and it, the special was great. But nobody nobody wanted it. So my uh, management went to Comedy Central, and they said, "Look, we'll give you this guy. Will you please put him on, and we'll give you this other guy that's more famous as well." So it was one of those kind of deals. Uh -huh. So Comedy Central said, "Okay." Uh, we'll take Dunham, we'll play it one time, and that's it, and <laughs> stop bothering us. And they said, fine. So it aired on a Friday night, and then on Monday, we called them for the ratings, and they said, um, uh, we think there's been some kind of mistake. We'll, we'll uh, get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, doing comedy clubs for 20 years, I built that grassroots following all over the place. So when people tuned in, it was like the numbers were off the charts, and they couldn't get the second one fast enough. So it was, that, that, was, that was a cool time in life. Man, that's great. You know, like in my case, it's not that uh, that, that I, I bring props or anything, but I, I was fighting uphill, like you said, doing very well on the comedy circuit, but couldn't get anywhere else. 
And uh, I think that there's sort of a built-in resistance to the jackass guy as a stand-up comedian, you know? And mm -hmm. where I thought I cracked the code was, you know, I, I got my first special. You know, it came and went with, like, very mediocre viewership. And as mm -hmm. I put together my subsequent hour, one night performing on stage, it just struck me. Oh, my God. All of these salacious, crazy, true stories I'm telling like for the most part happened on camera. So I can right. keep developing this act and then in post-production actually edit the footage of said stories into it oh, so that yeah. it's a fully multimedia presentation. We've never seen that before, you know, like the, the, wow. the comedian standing there holding the mic, except the stuff I'm talking about is edited in. And I was just like, wow. So I just immediately set out to start recording my performances, putting it all in the computer, editing it together. It worked fantastically well. And I was wow. absolutely completely just convinced that this was going to be where I cracked the code and then everybody right. had to recognize me and they're going to, and I funded the special because of the multimedia. And I went and filmed all these extra things to like have vignettes right. with, with all of the vignettes. I spent more like $300,000 on it wow. and yeah. nobody would buy it. And I was in that position with this special that is my baby. And I loved it. It's so great. It's the one called gnarly, which I duct taped myself to the billboard for, Right. No, nobody would buy it. And here I was uh, watching your documentary and it said, uh, you know, you had this special, nobody would buy it. And I was like, that's me. <laughs> I were kindred spirits, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. But okay. uh, I almost think that it, it um, turned out to be a, a blessing rather than a curse that nobody would buy it. Because what I did was... Uh, you know, build a player into my website with, uh, you know, streaming it right there with my own little paywall. And I got right. my money back. I even made some money on it. So wow, that's great. And I own it forever. Really cool. So yeah. yeah, yeah, the world is so different right now. It's almost like you don't need anybody anymore. It's, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, so like my, my special is coming up on, uh, fr on Friday after Thanksgiving. And uh, and, and I think so, we can go ahead and call that tomorrow <laughs> because this will come out on uh, on Thanksgiving Day. Thanksgiving. Oh. So right. as people are anyway. just watching this freshly, it's coming out tomorrow. And if and if if today is the day after Thanksgiving, then tune in right now. Where are right. they watching it? Eight o'clock at Comedy Central, Eastern and Pacific, and the the middle time zones, Mountain and uh, Central. I'm, I, it screws me up. I don't know how it works. You know, you know what I. By the way, when I moved to Los Angeles, I grew up in the Central time zone, so I moved to Los Angeles. Oh, where'd you grow up? I grew up in five different countries. Oh, oh my God! <laughs> Never mind. He's a triple national. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Never mind. But when I moved out to California, it's like, what do you mean football comes on at 10 a.m.? That's not right. No, <laughs> right. No, no, wonder, no, no wonder nobody goes to church out here. It's so funny <laughs> that when I moved to California, I was furious that the bars closed at 2 a.m. <laughs> 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 it's totally different, but, but still the same. <laughs> what, what part of the central time zone did you grow up? I was in Dallas. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I lived there for uh, many years and then came out here and that was it. You've been very faithful to Comedy Central. Am I correct? You've, you've had previously six comedy specials. Well, I, 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 I slept around after a little while. So I was with them. I, if, if you say six, then I'll believe you. That sounds about right. And then for a little while, I left them and did one on NBC and then two on Netflix. But now we're back to Comedy Central. And I, you know, I, I have of their the top four specials on uh, highest ratings ever. I have the uh, three of those. Wow. So it, it's really nice to come back and... Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's great, but it's one of a, it's one of three. So apparently, if this one goes well, uh, there's going to be two more after this. But you know, here, here's the weird part. I don't know if this was in the press release or whatever it was, but and this is uh, true. Not one of these jokes had I ever told to any other human being on the planet before I walked on stage that night and taped the special. Oh because, my god! Because yeah, usually what I would do is spend eighteen or twenty four months building the show joke by joke and bit by bit you know you build it on the road and sure. uh, you make sure it works you do it over and over again and uh, just make sure you got it down this time like everybody i'm sitting around and i don't know how the road warriors have done it the guys that have been on the road forever like rock bands and the crews and all that what are the stories that are going to come out what are these guys doing with their time yeah are, are, you, are you making reference hours, to the pandemic out. huh yeah Art. okay and i was sitting around going what the hell am i going to do and then i thought I saw a couple other guys come out with specials and I thought, you know what? I can do this too. So, uh, got together with a handful of uh, my 
writer friends and we wrote uh, all the stuff. And then for two weeks, I sat in my office for five and six hours a day, just cobbling this stuff together, putting the right jokes for the right characters, rewriting and putting it all together, all on the computer. Didn't practice it for anybody. Didn't say it, didn't even tell a joke to my wife, none to my friends and walked on stage that. And I thought, I don't know if this is going to work. So basically what I did was I talked Comedy Central into buying an open mic night. Nice. Oh, that's great. So, <laughs> yeah. so when was this taped? Uh, three weeks ago. Holy crap. What, what did the audience look like? I'll tell you, if that audience looked anything like I do right now, then it looked sweet. Because I'm feeling fit and frankly jacked. Why? Because I'm training smart, man. I know when to train. How? Well... I got my Whoop app tells me, like, for example, today is a green day. It's go time, baby. And so I'm going to be working out like crazy. You know, the last time I went surfing, it just automatically knew, like, you went surfing. It's because my Whoop band, I wear it on my right wrist. This thing is the most badass fitness tracker in the world connects to the app knows exactly how much i slept like how much i recovered what my activities were how much i'm ready to train in the morning and speaking of training i'm getting ready to go on a big old badass bike ride from los angeles all the way to san diego and down the coast mind you it's gonna be way over 100 miles and i'm ready you know why because i'm training smart and i'm training good yeah, thanks to my Whoop app, and I want you to try it. So you're going to go to whoop.com, W-H-O-O-P.com. You're going to sign up, and when you check out, use the promo code Stevo. You get 15% off. Again, that's 15% off at checkout when you use the promo code Stevo at whoop.com. Really, it's making me fitter, more rested, happier, and healthier. And I want the same for you. So try it out. Now let's talk about this audience. Oh, it was great. We, we, we did it in Malibu. And this is how stupid I am. I've been living here for 30 years. And, I, I, and I'm 15 miles away from Malibu. I always thought Malibu was like the beach. And that was it. I had no idea that there was like canyons and mountains in Malibu. Because somebody said, we found a good venue in Malibu. I'm like, oh, that's great. We'll have the beach behind us. And we'll see some waves. Yeah, it'll be nice. <laughs> no, yeah. no, no. It was, in, it was in the mountains in the canyon. It was at a winery. And uh, it was great. Cal Calamigos Ranch. Oh, Calamigos. okay. Oh, is that the place that Volcano? has the giraffe that makes everybody mad? No, no, no. No, oh, no, 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 no. Actually, I, I, <laughs> it's not. Uh, Calamigos Ranch. I just shot there for something super top secret. <laughs> yeah, pretty really? re pretty recently. Yeah, it, oh, it, 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 had, yeah. it, it had a uh, it had a huge Ferris wheel. Was there a Ferris wheel there? Man, we're talking about two different places. <laughs> <laughs> Giraffes and Ferris wheels. Right. Okay, it's George Clooney's tequila. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was um it was a hundred people. Uh, and everybody properly socially distanced and everybody had on masks. And, and uh, you know, what's funny is Comedy Central didn't want to talk about it, didn't want to uh, put press to this thing until after two weeks had passed mm. to make sure that we weren't a super spreader. Nice. But, then I, but then I'm like, well, what if we had been a super spreader? Would you have just trashed the special and like never shown it? I don't, I didn't understand what the point was, but it's a good apparently, question. <laughs> apparently we did everything right and nobody died. So there you go. Hmm. So yeah. when you're, I'm Paul, by the way. I'm off camera, oh, Jeff. Nice dude, to meet I you. I forgot to introduce hey, Paul. Paul. No worries. No I was worries too at excited. all. But going into this show, I would assume it was a totally different feeling because normally it's like you toured it, you're confident in these jokes. Was it was it a different feeling walking out on stage for this show where no one had heard these jokes yet? Well, you know, my normal audiences are, you know, this is the arenas. It's like between six and ten thousand. So uh, this was should have been somewhat of a shock. But I've been sitting around for months you know, doing jokes for my five-year-old twin boys mm -hmm. <laughs> and the dog. So to walk on stage after eight months, having not been anywhere, and then you got a hundred people ready to see you, it wasn't as much of a shock as I thought it would be. Had mm -hmm. I gone one night from, you know, a bunch of people in an arena to this, then that would have been shocking. But I, it was just kind of a relief as a performer. It's like, you gotta, you know, you gotta have the drug. And so I, you know, and I wasn't really worried about it because, you know, as comics, you 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 build those bits from timing. You can from just timing and presentation. You you, you do the thing enough times 
you can start getting laughs where you never thought there'd be laughs before because you think of new stuff and just add a joke here and a line there. This I wasn't as worried about because it was just joke, 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 all related jokes, a routine that was kind of built. But it wasn't like, you know, there, there were none of the nuances that would have happened had this ad, had this been, you know, performed a hundred times. Mm-hmm. So, so I know I wasn't scared. It was like, either this is going to work or it's not going to work. But, you know, audiences like that, they have to jump through fiery hoops to get there, meaning they really want to be there. They had to go through testing. They had the thing shoved up their face right. three days before. Uh, so they're they're ready to laugh, you know. Cool. And I'm curious also your preparation, like because there's a skill set involved, too, which is the ventriloquism. Like how much is spent on mastering the ventriloquism and how much is spent on like the, the comedy? Well, and ventriloquist wise, it's kind of like learning to play a sport or an instrument. Once you got it, you got the basics down and it's okay. not that big a deal. So okay. I'm just on stage talking and moving a dummy. That's about it. Nice. So, okay. yeah, there wasn't really, you know, I, maybe I was a little out of practice on the not moving the lips kind of thing. But, uh, you know, otherwise it's it's like <laughs> it is just like riding a bike. What's the dog's name again? It's Wendy. Wendy. Why, why Wendy? Um, I, you know, it's the first name that popped into my mind when I found her in the streets of Peru. What the hell? The streets of Peru? She's and a, how do you get a dog from Peru to here? I guess it's not a big deal? Uh, it wasn't a big deal for me because I was shooting a television series down there and the production took care of all of the jumping through hoops and red tape. And all I had to do was pick her up at the airport. <laughs> That's pretty great. Ah, oh, dude, <laughs> this, this dog goes with me everywhere, man. I, That's not, I'm, so is, is this a tour bus? What are you on right now? Uh, it's an RV. It's an, uh, RV. it's an RV. I use it as my movie trailer. Uh, the the adventures of my of my surf hobby and 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 weekend camping trips, and it's our podcast studio and soon to be a mobile tattoo shop, because That's- I'm. That's nice. So an RV meaning it's it's got the engine. It's not a trailer. Correct. Correct. It okay. is built on yeah, I, a Dodge ProMaster, uh, and it's got got a bathroom. It's got a shower. Eh, it's a toilet and a shower, a wet bath. We just bought an Airstream and drove it up to Montana to visit my uh, one of my daughters. So that was that was an experience. What's funny nowadays is you know you see people all over the highways now that are complete amateurs and don't know how to pull a trailer. They're flipping them over all the time. You know that, right? Oh, dude, that's great, man. I I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I had a, a smaller van and I was trying to do uh, this the thing with skateboard ramps. So I rented a trailer. I could not reverse with a trailer to save my life. Like, <laughs> is that something that you ever figure out? Right. Yeah, that's yeah, that's the hard part. No, we, we pulled into this one campground and it was like, you know, you want to pull through. You don't want to have to back it in. And we pulled into this place in the evening. The sun was going down. And of course, everybody there is a complete, you know, everybody's well seasoned. It's all old guys. They know what's going on. And here I come har- hardly ever having backed up a trailer in my life. And this thing's 33 feet long. And I'm like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? And and it's a and it's not a pull through. I got to back it in. And my wife, I said to my wife, just get out. You know how to do this. Just, you know, point which direction if I start going the wrong way. And it was one of those where God was having a boring day and he said, I'm going to help this, help this chucklehead out. I mean, I pulled it in one shot. Perfect. And I got, I I got out and the guy goes, wow, that was nice, dude. I'm like, thanks, man. Yeah. Not hard. (laughs) It was total lucky shot. Wow. Oh my God. I was, I was the worst with it. I'm horrible. We have a street, my street here. We live at the end of the cul-de-sac and there's no way in hell that, that, I, that you can drive that trailer down here and turn around. So I had to back it a quarter mile down, oh, a, windy, shoot. down, down a windy street. It took an hour to go a quarter of a mile. That'll I get you good. Holes. Yeah. I, I looked like an idiot. What, what made you want to get the Airstream? Was it that when you're on your arena tour, you're living on a tour bus and you just fall in love with that mobile home kind of a setup? Yeah, well, the, the, the tour bus lives in Pennsylvania. I don't know why. It just does. And so for the family, though, we needed, you know, something that, that I could do because I, I, I've, driven, I've driven my own bus before. I actually stole my own tour bus once. And look, I got nothing on you. I can't tell any stories that you'll be impressed with. But there was one day, uh, uh, one morning that we had, um, yeah, it was one morning on a Sunday morning. My, you know, I crew and everybody, everybody's asleep. And I get up and there's my tour bus sitting 
at, at the arena. And I'm like, you know, I, I wake up in the morning and I'm like, there's nobody around here. And it's, we were, I don't know where we were, somewhere in the Southeast. It was a Sunday morning. Nobody was on the streets. And I'm like, I'm going to drive this thing. <laughs> so I, I'd watched my driver, Dana. I'd watched him, I'd watched him a few times. So I knew how to start it up. And I thought, I don't know what the hell I'm doing, but I'm going to drive this damn thing around. So I got uh, one of my buddies with me and he started the camera and we did a Facebook live and I started this thing up and just started driving around town. And I, I kept bottoming out. Every time we go over here, a slight, a slight bump, it went, yeah. I'm like, what the hell? There's got to be a button around here. Cause I knew I was low riding it. I, I didn't, you know, I, I should have used the, uh, the airbags or something to pick it up, but we drove it around town. I kept bottoming the damn thing out, tearing up the street. And, um, uh, we went to Starbucks. So, <laughs> and my, and my bus driver told me later that his, his phone started to explode. He said, all kinds of people started calling him and saying, Jeff has stolen your tour bus. And he goes, no, it's his tour bus. He can, he can crash it if he wants wow. to. Wow. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. I can't impress you, dude. So uh, never no, I, I love <laughs> that. And, and you, you had me at arena. <laughs> like the, uh, the, the whole idea now, we spoke to a comedian who does an arena tour, or you know, Gabriel Iglesias. He talks about every single show is the full catwalk, the whole like, you know, he says you can't go into an arena and just stand there with a microphone. You got to bring him that whole experience. And and uh, like he had semi trucks. He was talking about how many semi trucks does it take to put on a Jeff Dunham show at an arena? Uh, I'm not that, I'm not into effects and any of that kind of stuff. We have a giant, a 50 foot, uh, video wall that's over my head. Um, and then an amazing sound system and a stage, uh, all the staging and the lights and sound. So we do all those basics, all the important stuff. I don't have anything fancy like a catwalk or any of that crap. Um, but, uh, we have two semis and then my tour bus and the crew tour bus and a crew of 12. Um, but that went a merchandise truck. I have crap. I sell crap. I, dude, that's, we love that, man. <laughs> we love selling crap. We talk to people all the time who just seem to be doing so much better at us, or so much better than us, than we are doing the same things. Uh, yeah, like, wait, you got a whole semi truck just for merch? No, that's a, that's a, a uh, what do you call it? A, a panel truck. So it's, yeah, it's, it's big, but it's not a semi. Okay. Yeah. But you're doing well, like we'll six do. to 9,000 people. We're doing like right. three to 600, you know. Right, and now right. we'll probably be doing better because we got upgraded to theaters. Right. We just. If you're doing theaters, if you're doing theaters, yeah. And so your per head number is the big deal, you know. I don't exactly. know what we do per head. I think it's like, I can't remember. It's just been, oh my God, it's been so long. I'm forgetting all this stuff. But yeah, <laughs> I, I bet you can do really well on the per head. What do you guys sell? Do you sell bobbleheads and all glad that? Glad you asked. <laughs> I'm glad, glad you asked. <laughs> we, uh, we do well, we got a couple Books, of different shirts, posters. I, I, have, I have a book we got posters sunglasses socks sunglasses hats, socks hats dick pen, dick uh, pens. hoodies dick pick pens hot sauce <laughs> you know the, you know there's hot pen sauce. hot sauce, hot sauce? Yeah, yeah you can get sauce. it on amazon hot sauce for your butthole it's called steve-o's hot sauce for your butthole and it is available on amazon yeah. <laughs> and, and, and where did you find the hot sauce company how did that happen we uh they, they, it was one of these private label companies, and they had the craziest array of different sauces for us to try. And, and um, yep. you know, we tried, and I liked this one kind, and I liked this other kind. And I was actually able to combine them. So technically, I created a completely mm -hmm. unique and original hot sauce. That, uh, which is available on Amazon. Which is available on Amazon. It's also available at stevo.com. Uh, right. <laughs> I'm, I'm, go I'm going. So it, it's called uh, Steve. All I do, all I got to enter is Stevo and hot sauce, right? And I'll find yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Stevo, exactly. Stevo and hot sauce. And, and, you got it. Have your people reach out to me. I'll send you a case. I'll send you a gallon of hot sauce for your butthole. Yeah, we sell about <laughs> a gallon. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't wait. Oh, that's great. I, I love hearing stuff like that because I I was at a I was eating at a fancy steak restaurant once. I was going through the wine thing and it said uh, Dunham Cellars, of wine. and I'm like Dunham Cellars. That wow. I'm not. I don't know if I'm related, but I doubt it. So I ended up contacting them and I said, and they were apparently fans. And so we ended up. They were the, they did the same thing. They sent me a bunch of different wines and I was able to pick three different ones. And um, mm. so we had it on my website for a long time. But it was genius what they did is they took their regular bottle of wine, but when somebody would call them from my website and want, you know, the Ahmed Syrah or whatever it was, 
they would take the wine and they had another sticker made that looked exactly like their label, but it was Ahmed done in the same uh, paper and the same everything foil. And so they stuck it on there and it looked like they we'd done a completely customized wine just for me. Hmm. And it was just bullshit because it was just their wine with little, one little sticker of mine yeah. on it. Smart. And they, uh, they, sold it, label. They, sold, they sold it for a long time. And then I don't know what happened. I, I don't know if they're uh, democratic and I lean right or whatever, but I must've told a joke or something because that, that relationship ended and I don't know what I did wrong. <laughs> ah, they probably yeah, made some fuck you money off that and just quit. Yeah. You get, I, I don't know. Either that or no, I, you know, come to think of it, I don't think many of my fans drink wine. So maybe that was the problem. All mine are beer. Steve, when you go to a comedy club, do you know what food and beverage they stock up on when you go? I know that as a sober guy, I've been sober for 12 years, yeah. yet my audience at the comedy clubs just drinks more alcohol <laughs> than anybody who ever goes through those comedy clubs. I have the most alcoholic, thirsty <laughs> audience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, mine was beer. They always had to stock up on beer, bottled beer for some reason. Budweiser. Yeah, 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 probably. Who not Coors for Lone Star, for God's sake. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hey, I, I believe it, man. So so now all the stuff that you sell, like when you're not on the road, like when uh, it's just online, you, can we plug your website where people buy yeah, your merch online? Sure. Yeah, it's jeffdunham.com, and uh, uh, we're getting ready to open an Amazon store. I have a few things on Amazon, but uh, we're getting ready to open an Amazon store. But, yeah, jeffdunham.com. I don't know. I have – man, the stuff that, that we've come up with uh, has been great. And I love – do I have anything in here? No, I got bobbleheads, and uh, none of my stuff's in here. It's all toys. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but we have bobbleheads. We have talking animatronic dummies uh, or dolls of my characters we have actual full-size ventriloquist dummies of my characters oh wow but we have the t-shirts and the you know all the typical stuff and they just did a um uh funko pop um just like they did with gabe and those went real well uh and i i made the mistake of saying okay guys we're gonna sell the autographed ones but not let's not put a limit on them yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you know how long it takes to sign 10,000 Funko Pops? <laughs> I just did 12,000 signed prints for charity with Tony Hawk. You're retarded too. <laughs> yeah. That's you know, a lot. And, and, and that's it. We, 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 we sell all this stuff all the time. And then when we do the one damn thing for charity, that's when we, we go gangbusters. Like, <laughs> you, you didn't get a piece of it. Not right? a penny. I made an actual <laughs> point. Of a one hundred percent of the proceeds go to charity, and we're sitting there watching doing all the work to fulfill. I'm 12, still 000, working on it. Twelve thousand <laughs> orders. And it's just like wow, that was the hit. <laughs> and, and, what, and what was it? What was the thing? It was. was uh, it? I got together with Tony Hawk, the legendary skateboarder, and we yeah. pushed two ramps up against a wall so that we could come at you know a good clip, and you ride up the ramp, and then you're doing this sort of a, a large wall ride. And he right. went off a bigger ramp than I did, so kind of as a double rainbow, we're both we're both riding on the wall together. And then we came down on a on a ramp and, and and successfully pulled it off. It's a pretty impressive photo, and we wow. both we both signed uh, the you know twelve thousand prints. So. It's so funny. I've had a couple people reach out to me on the website, and, and they're like, "Hey, you guys sent me the wrong product. This isn't what I ordered." And I'm like, "Can you send me what we've sent you?" And it's the same picture, but it's sideways. And I'm like, <laughs> turn it upright. And they're like, oh, fuck, I'm an idiot. <laughs> no I've had that like four times happen with that print, dude. It's so I think funny. They had the, yeah, I don't know, man. But, uh, okay, so when, when when people go to jeffdunham.com, they, they order, uh, uh, how much is a, a full-size ventriloquist dummy? I don't know. When I say full-size, you know, it's like full-size like kid size it's like four, four, 40 inches tall something like that uh -huh. we were selling them for 100 bucks we got Ahmed the dead terrorist he's for 100 bucks but it's good because it's got the mechanism and the whole deal with the head on the stick sure and, that so, sounds yeah. like a great deal and yeah. uh and and how does the, that order get fulfilled is it uh we, we have a warehouse and we've got a couple people working in there when i go on tour you know they it's all hell for them because they're packing pallets and shipping out pallets and all that so now it's been kind of a downtime for them but uh as a husband and wife, and they run the warehouse, and every once in a while we have uh, temp uh, people come over when uh, orders get heavy. But they run that warehouse, and there's, you know, piles of crap. And, you know, it's really interesting to me 
when something goes out of fashion or something we don't sell, because, you know, you're always going to have X number of those things. And so I, I like going in there and just going through the crap that I forgot about. Every once in a while, we'll give that stuff to either the military or to charity mm. or whatever. Because it's shirts and, you know, uh, I can't remember. Somebody sent me a picture one time of some poor kid in like East Africa or something like that. And he had on one of my shirts. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Like, I don't know if I should feel good about that or bad about that. You know, it, so. It, it's so cool to hear you say that because we just like uh it's a, a couple weeks ago or three weeks ago maybe mm-hmm. we got the keys to our first warehouse where we're, we're like we're, we're renting a warehouse and we're nice. we're actually the ones fulfilling our own orders because yeah. the, this third party fulfillment center that we were using I mean we were one of 3600 clients there and it just like just we just felt lost in the shuffle and we decided you know what we can do better by our people if we uh, do it ourselves. Yeah, nobody loves you more than you, and so the, the you know like uh, Eleanor uh, uh, Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, yeah, <laughs> it said if you're gonna do something right, do it yourself. So um, uh, that's the way we were. We, we did the same thing. We had a third party fulfillment company, and they were you know. I just, I never felt like it was done right. And I knew they were getting too much money. And we thought, sure. nope, same exactly what you did. We thought, yeah. nope, we're going to get a warehouse. We're going to hire some people and make it a family, quote, family thing, make it all in-house. And it's been great. The only trouble is I got to give bigger bonuses at Christmas. <laughs> that's, that's a good problem to have. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice yeah. too, because like, I'm really impatient in, especially in business. And if we're paying money, I want it now. And like, now that we have our own fulfillment house, it's like, if I want something done, it gets done immediately versus sending an email, getting a response back. Then three days later, it's like, it's too late. So now, yeah. now that we're in control, it's, it's fantastic. I made the mistake of looking at the dummy, uh, behind you and it keeps staring at me and now I'm kind of freaking <laughs> out. Is it this over here? Yeah. 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 See, those are, those are old, those are really old dummies and that were made in, during the depression. I wasn't even ready for how interesting the story about those dolls was going to be. But you know how I said I'm a healthier guy these days? Let me tell you. I've been getting laid a lot. I've been getting laid really good. And check out my little chunk of puss over here. Yeah, honey. Let me say getting laid. Yep. And you know what else I'm doing in a real healthy way? Pooping. Here's a news flash for you. Yeah, news flash. The human body was not designed to poop sitting down on a toilet. No, the human body is designed to be standing up and squatting like that. That's why I use Squatty Potty. Check this out. I mean, you sit on the toilet right there. This Squatty Potty stool elevates your legs puts you in that healthy squatting position for a complete, total evacuation. And by evacuation, I mean get all that sloppy poop out. Poop completely. Yeah. We got squatty potty on every single toilet. And I, I, I won't, just won't poop without it. I hate having to improvise. If I'm on the road, it's like, give me a trash can or something. No, no. A microwave in the hotel room. Yeah, no, I'm serious about this. Squatty Potty is important to me, and I want you to try it. So you're going to go to squattypotty.com slash stevo, and you get 20% off your order. I'm telling you guys, if you're not using Squatty Potty, you're not pooping healthy, and that needs to change. So, one more time, you're going to go to squattypotty.com slash stevo you get 20 percent off your order and you're gonna thank me for it <laughs> now let's hear about those dolls the little tiny one there with the orange hair that's called mortimer snurd he's a little plastic one that i got that's my first dummy i got when i was in the third grade oh, but wow. these other two as where at well as those guys up there those were all built uh, during the depression by two brothers with zero uh, education on how to do it. And they became like the Porsche of Ventrola's wow. dummy. Wow. Uh, I love let that. Let me show you real quick. Hold on. Let me see. I think I can get his Oh, head man. Off. You know, I was going to feel like a jerk asking you to hold up a, 
a dummy for the thumbnail. <laughs> 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 but looks like I'm going to get it anyway. So this is not... Right? You got to believe that a Jeff Dunham thumbnail for the podcast performs better if he's holding a dummy. No, no, don't, don't use this one. This is not one of my characters. This is one that okay. was like, like years wow. and years ago. Wow. Let me, let me show you. This is a typical ventriloquist dummy, but not. You know what I mean? What I love about my characters is that they're not, they're not the typical ventriloquist dummy. But what's amazing about this guy is all the stuff that he does. Jesus, dude. dude. Yeah, so it's like there's the mouth, there's the upper lip. Let me get him a little closer. Here. I rarely felt badly for the people who are listening only on the audio only version. Oh, well, they got to go to YouTube and yeah, check it out. They have to come yeah. check it out. That's all. Well, I'll, I'll describe it. So there's the mouth moves, the upper lip moves, the eyebrows move. Wow. The eyes go side to side and up and down. And that's and from the Porsche looks, people? Hair, hair goes oh, up. Dude. Like he goes cross-eyed. Oh, what's cross, oh, that's his nose. He says sniff like that. His ears go out. Oh. Uh, he looks like, he can go like this. I think that does it, his nose lights up. You can barely see that. So it's like, you know, but this thing is compla freaking cated. I feel mm. like I'd want a, a separate hotel room on my rider for that guy because if I woke up in the middle of the night to piss and he was looking at me, I wouldn't be able to sleep anymore. <laughs> well, let me show you just from a technical thing. I just Again, you're right. Don't want to bore the people that are only listening, but this is how complicated these things are. So wow. back here, you see all Holy these uh, levers and, and keys. But that's not what a typical dummy is like. What so year was that made? Was, huh? What year is, was that made? Nin 1937. It's like Morse wow. code. Wow. Yep, yep. And this thing is probably worth about 25, 30 grand. Oh, my gosh. That's all? I can totally believe that that was worth more. Oh, it's a piece of Americana. It's a piece of artwork. It's, uh, you know, it's amazing. So am I a jerk you, if I ask I'll, you to hold up one of your characters? Yeah, I'll show you my new guy yeah. that I created. I created him during the pandemic. And, oh, nice. Because um, you have uh, a mask on? Nah, that would, ru that would ruin everything, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But nobody's so, mouth um, is moving. Please don't tell that joke. You know how many people have sent me memes and jokes and like, hey, you're, 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 your job's really easy now. You can wear a mask. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, but this guy I created online and we did a series of YouTube videos uh, as I created him all the way from, you know, sculpting the head all the way through the 3D scanning and the 3D printing. And um, yeah, oh, that's what it said in your documentary that you're so involved in actually making these characters, building these puppets yourself. Yeah, yeah, I do it all myself. But let me show you this guy. So this guy... Every, we all have our internet trolls, and so he's an internet troll. And we had a we had a naming contest online, and some guy came up with this name, and I thought it was great. But we named him Earl, but it's spelled U R L. Nice. <laughs> so, uh, where did the name Dummy come from? Like, why did they call it a dummy? Is that is I there any? That's a Google question. I have no idea. I should know the answer. A to dummy, that. like it's a dummy, like it's something that's uh, fake. I don't know. I feel like you hurt their feelings. <laughs> so this is Earl, and uh, what's up, uh, Earl? This is the uh, the genius part of him that I like. It's like this. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. And uh, yeah. Like, uh, for sure, I get to talk to, like, Steve-O. That's, like, uh, my favorite thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, man, he's, he's not going to say anything mean about me? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, anyway, I have never used him in a show, um, and I was going to use him on the special. <clears throat> That's on tomorrow at 8 o'clock Pacific and Eastern. Um, uh, uh, I, did, I was going to use him on the show, but... It takes a long time to develop the character and to really figure out who he is because I got to get to know him. Because I, I pride myself in being more of a hopefully a comedy writer. Because if I come up with one setup, one uh, question, if I'm a good comedy writer, every one of those characters will have a different answer for it. Mm -hmm. So I haven't gotten to know that guy well. There's two characters in my career that did not work out, and it's because I could not think like them. Ahmed the Dead Terrorist, I, I understand that guy. We all get that mad every once in a while. We don't really kill people, but we, you know, you, you envision it maybe now and then. Um, there's Bubba J, the, the redneck guy. I grew up in Texas. I get that. There's Peanut, my little wild and crazy purple guy. There's Walter, my curmudgeonly old man. All those things I get. But when I created the female character for a movie called Dinner for Schmucks, um, we had all that we got all the rights for me, able to, me be able to use her in my act after the movie. I, I could not think like a woman. I could not, I, I couldn't write jokes. I didn't get it. I had other female comics help me write jokes. 
But it was like a pain in the ass because I had no earthly idea what to say in any given situation. You know, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't mm-hmm. legit. Uh-huh. So, and then the other one, and this was way back when, uh, I was trying to make fun of prejudice. So I came up with Sweet Daddy D, my black, my Af- African-American, uh, African-American character, the black character. And he was basically my, my, my manager, and he was a pimp. And I had a bunch of black writers, like three guys, uh, comics, I mean, help me write jokes for him. Because I'm like, I know you guys sit around and tell jokes about white people. So just tell me what those jokes are. You're not going to offend me because I want to know what those white jokes are. I want to make fun of myself and my race. I want to try and turn it around somehow. And that ca- and it came off okay. I actually used them in a special on Comedy Central and it came off all right. But it was the same thing. When I would sit there and try and ad lib with him in an interview or try and uh, write jokes for him, it, it was completely fake because I had no earthly idea. I can't put myself in the, in the African American's shoes. I have no idea what they lived through. So I couldn't, it just was not, it didn't work. It didn't work. How much like with the Ahmed, the dead terrorist, like that, when did that character begin? When, when did you first create that character? Well, it was a year after nine 11 and, um, uh, we hadn't found Osama bin Laden. Nobody knew where he was. Nobody knew what ha- had known what happened to him. Uh, uh, nobody knew. And I looked to Leno and Letterman at the time, and there's nothing funny about 9-11, never will be. I think even 100 years, you know, Titanic jokes now are still kind of, uh, so, you know, too many people died. So with 9-11, you're not going to make fun of that. But Leno and Letterman were making fun of those guys, Osama bin Laden and those guys who did the deed. So I thought, nobody knows where Osama is, but I know where he is. He's half dead, and he's hiding out and living in a suitcase with my characters. <clears throat> and so I was at a store called Oz here in Los Angeles, and they had this bumbling plastic uh, uh, skeleton. And usually what I do when I build a character or try it out, I, I have a little cheapy version of him first, and I try him out on stage and write the jokes. If it works, then I'll build the real character. And I thought, all right, I'm going to make this bumbling, stupid, idiot a uh, uh, skeleton and call him Ahmed. I mean, call him uh, the dead Osama. And so I made this bumbling skeleton out of this Halloween decoration, put a little turban on his head. And I thought, I'm not going to, I'm not going to chicken out and try and do this someplace far away from ground zero. Uh, I sat down and I wrote jokes, pretending, imagining that there were relatives of people who had died in 9-11, that they were sitting in that audience. What were they a year later ready to hear? What could they joke about? What could help them move forward? And what would be okay? So I wrote that material, and I went to a club called Bananas. Uh, There was a few Bananas, but it was six miles from Ground Zero. And I was pretty big in the comedy clubs back then. It was a sold out. The first show was a Friday night. Sold out Friday night, and uh, I did my first 45 minutes, and everything was great. They all loved me, so I was sold. And then I said to them, you know, there's one sentence we've all been waiting to hear. And that is Osama bin Laden is dead. The roof came off the place. And I said, well, I got a surprise for you. He's here with us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, Osama bin Laden. And it was like God took a vacuum and sucked out of the, all the air out of that comedy club. And I know they were thinking, what has this asshole from California decided to show us right now? And I pulled this stupid bumbling skeleton out of the suitcase and started going through the jokes and it was like, it, it couldn't have gone any better. And that's when I came up with the I kill you thing. And uh, <laughs> it was it was freaking awesome. And then I kept doing it year after year after year for about, I guess, like three three years, maybe. Not too long, but three years. And then everybody kind of forgot about Osama bin Laden, and I took him out of the act. And then come 2007, my second comedy special comes along, and I thought I better put two new characters in besides my old ones. And I thought, you know, that old dead Osama worked. But I always like to keep my specials evergreen. So if you look at it 10 years later, it's still funny. And you're not like, you know, making Richard Nixon jokes. So um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I thought, I'm going to change it from Osama bin Laden. And instead of offending one person, I'm going to offend an entire group of dangerous people. And so I called him Ahmed the Dead Terrorist. We didn't say where he was from. We didn't say where the accent was. Uh, there's even a point uh, and didn't say he was Muslim. He would make a point of saying he's not Muslim. I didn't want to pe- want people making think I was making fun of their religion. Um, and uh, uh, so brought him back and uh, is, and then created that iteration of the current iteration of him. 
and uh, uh, started doing that. And it went over great in the special. And then we came out with a song called uh, Jingle Bombs, which went bananas on YouTube. <laughs> and it went worldwide. Up. And that's when I started getting credible death threats. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> And uh, but it was uh, off to the races after that. So it was because of Ahmed and Jingle Bombs and Comedy Central and that special that kind of put me where I am now. Who were the death threats coming from? Uh, coming from the, the, the credible ones. Held were, held the, <laughs> the credible ones where we got the FBI involved. Uh, my ex-wife. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, uh, they were from the other side of the world. We don't really know. But I tell you, there's the negative and there's the positive because. Um, so many people embraced that. I was getting letters from the military from all over the world. I was getting letters from all, all kind, from parents of guys and women in the military. Uh, there were uh, we started selling little dolls of Ahmed. I was sent pictures of Ahmed sitting up in the window of helicopter <laughs> of military helicopters. They would make it artwork on the nose of the aircraft. Um, it was it was unbelievable. And and I also heard that uh, on good authority that there were businessmen in Iraq sitting around at lunch going, I kill you and laughing. So <laughs> that's funny, dude. Oh, and when I went and did a show in Abu Dhabi, I thought, oh my, this is terrifying. And uh uh all the front row was all the guys in the dish dash and you know, the the Muslim outfits and all that stuff and all the women were a few rows back. And and of course Ahmed was their hero. But then two nights later I'm in the middle of Tel Aviv Israel for two thousand Jewish people and guess who their favorite character was? Ahmed the dead. <laughs> I figured out the difference though. The Muslims love him because they think he's one of them. The Jews love him because he's dead. <laughs> okay. Wow, man, that's crazy. It, it, it just, I get the sense that, uh, they, that you've got diplomatic immunity. I remember, I'll never forget one time I, uh, you know, became, I became friendly with uh, some, some, some gangster rappers, you know, like uh, known as the G unit. And they, you know, wow. and, uh, and, and I went into their studio, this was so long ago, but I went into their, their mixtape studio and I was right. like, oh, you know, who, who are you guys beefing with? You know, like, who's the feud? <laughs> and you know, they would like mention something, I'd be like, they'd give me a name, and I'd be like, oh, that guy, like, oh, I'll kill that guy. Like, oh, this, you know, and I'm on a hot mic and I'm just trying to like, you know, engage in like really scary, you know, and then, and then I met Dave Chappelle so like shortly after that, I said, I said, Dave, dude, I think uh, I might get killed by a rapper <laughs> I think because I was in the studio talking all this trash on all these like really legitimately scary gangster rappers. And he said, oh, come on, Steve. He says, you're Steve-O. You got diplomatic immunity. <laughs> you can say whatever you want. What? Again, we have parallel, parallel uh, uh, things going on because my thought has always been do you really want to be the terrorist who kills the puppet guy? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. true. I, and I, I thought very, very much exactly the same thing. There's nothing tough about picking on Steve-O. <laughs> 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 yeah. I, I think so we, could do, we could do a tour together of offending people and no one would care. <laughs> right. I think we see very much eye to eye on that. And, uh, and, and where, like, when in, in the beginning, I told you how much I related to to you know this kind of kind of a, a, a fresh take a, an original approach to comedy and nobody wants to try the new thing you know uh, well the thing is i think my problem is that it's an old and tired art an art form and uh you know everybody makes fun of the prop guys they make fun of the the, the jugglers and the ventriloquists and the variety acts um and and ventriloquism is even worse because even in vaudeville days we weren't the main act. We were the guys that were shoved out on stage while they closed the curtain and reset the show for the <laughs> real variety acts. So we were just between. And it wasn't until a guy named Edgar Bergen came along in the 30s and, and uh, had a number one radio show uh, for 10 years. Um, he was like the Seinfeld of the radio era that, that, that it became a mainstay. But look, I know what I do and I get it. And it's, it's lame. Even I look at my own, my own publicity shots and go, really? There's a grown man <laughs> sitting there with five dolls <laughs> and he pretends he's talking to them and people buy it. It's just, is this really, this is why I think we live in a, in a, uh, uh, a simulation because the fact that I'm selling out arenas w with the dummies is like, like, there's, there's a man, there's a, there's a guy and a son playing a video game somewhere. 
And the son says to the dad, let's make a ventriloquist really famous and sell out giant uh, venues. <laughs> and the dad goes, you're nuts. But yeah, that sounds fun. Let's try that. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, I, I saw it on the news that, that uh, like the highest level of scientists uh, like suggested that there's the, the we really might be actually living in in some kind of a man-made computer simulation, and then that's what we're actually living in. And I mean, and, and, if there's a lot of stuff to point to to make it seem like okay, what the? F <laughs> that's weird. <laughs> Exhibit A: Jeff Dunham. <laughs> <laughs> right, and, and you know the, what you just said too about the the ventriloquists. They were the guys that got shoved out while you know they put the curtain to reset. I don't know if you know this, but my first uh, profession was circus clown. <laughs> I was. Uh, oh no! Wow! Oh, I remember somebody saying that a long time ago. I was uh, I was a circus clown and a uh, graduate of Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Clown College. And wow. very, and when I worked in the circus, it was one hundred percent so that they could be setting up and breaking down the trampoline. I gotta be like, hey, look over here! Don't look at what they're setting up and breaking down over there. <laughs> wow, you guys are alike, <laughs> dude. And yeah. how long did you do that? Ah, uh, I did it for I that I didn't get a contract with Ringling Brothers after graduating Clown College, which is pretty sad because it was like, it it, it wasn't a high paying job, or <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And then I did get a contract for, for, for Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines. I was a clown on cruise ships for six months, got fired from that. And then I went to work at uh, the flea market circus where I where, uh, distracted from the trampolines. Hey, hang on, you skipped the best part. How do you get fired off a cruise ship? What, do you do? <laughs> what it was, was that uh, <laughs> I was part of a, of a clown troop. There were the boss clowns and then they were, they were trying to sort of like add new tiers. So the, I worked in a group of four clowns i was one of four and we worked underneath the boss clowns um and you know our, we were supposed to be writing material and do there as well as like going around the ship and entertaining people and we would perform in the theater in the theater at night to open up for the big vegas style show and it was just that I had like a whole bunch of cool bar tricks up my sleeve. I, would, I had all these like little things I'd do. I had this idea of what I thought was rad and I didn't really care for the type of comedy that the other clowns I worked with were trying to write. I was just like, I don't think that's funny. I think that sucks. I don't think you guys like are really rad with your skills. They'd be like working on their little little bits and I'd just have my earphones in and I'd be practicing my juggling. You know, like I just went, I, I was disrespectful of them and I felt like I didn't have to worry about it because when it came time to entertain people, I really had the goods. Like, you know, and, but what happened was all three of the other clowns went to the cruise ship brass not even just the boss clowns but the brass <laughs> of the cruise ship and they said look if steve-o comes back for another contract we all quit it was a clown what? mutiny <laughs> wow oh well i know but had i not been fired from that job uh i would have missed out on the the the, the jackass pilot Wow. Because because they got me off that ship just in the nick of time to go shoot for the jackass pilot, and wow. and uh, had that not been the case, I would have been juggling oranges in the middle of the damn Caribbean Ocean on a stupid cruise ship, and I never would have. And and you wouldn't have the RV and uh, you wouldn't <laughs> Wendy have from the Peru. Cotton ball and uh, yeah, or Wendy from Peru. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and it was I went out and shot for the pilot for Jackass, and once that was in the can, I came back and I got the job at the flea market circus. <laughs> and I worked there for another. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do with the flea market circus? This is in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. It was the uh, the 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 largest sw uh, flea market swap meet, and, and actually the record they hold is the largest drive-in movie theater with fourteen screens, I mm. believe, drive-in movie theater at the flea market. Plus, it's an amusement park, and they had a circus. Like a full on like one ring circus with three elephants and a tiger, which really upset me. And uh, I was I told I showed up. I said, "Hey, man, I'm a clown. I'm a graduate of clown college." They said, "You start tomorrow." <laughs> wow! So, wow! And I showed so up the next you, day. You, 
What did you do? Well, I, I, I essentially, I, I auditioned. <laughs> I, I did drugs, yeah. <laughs> uh, I auditioned in, for an, in an actual show. You know, like, uh, they just show up and, all right, get out there, show us what you got. And you know, here, here we're at the flea market. They, they, they liked everything that I did. Uh, I had different gags that... Um, that I stole from the circus. Uh, I had some stuff that was, um, you know, unique to me. I would do a skateboard act, a fire breathing acrobatics act, a balancing act. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine this guy comes okay. in for an interview. And you're like, <laughs> all right, Jeff, I made a lot of kids cry. All right. <laughs> did you quit or did you get fired? Ah, uh, that one I got fired because I, 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 I got fired for every job I ever had. <laughs> they, uh, they, like I, 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 when I got the call that, that the Jackass pilot was ordered to series, and right. they said that they were going to come out to Florida to film me for the first season of the series, I went and told the circus owners, like, hey, guys, I'm going to be famous. It's going to be great, and MTV is going to come. They're going to film this show. And uh, just on the exact day I said that would happen, Knoxville showed up at the circus with the camera crew, and the circus owner comes to me and says, what are these assholes doing here filming my elephants? I said, it's MTV. I'm, they're not... I told you they were coming. They're not going to, like, <laughs> do anything and, and, and get themselves in trouble. Like, he says, ah, he just gave me this grumpy little whole thing, and then I just like I told him I would, I went off and filmed for five days, came back, bandaged up, having been bitten by a shark, all beaten up and hung over, and I showed up back for work. I said, all right, I'm back. They said, we don't have, in the, don't have it in the budget to keep you around anymore. <laughs> wow. You're like, but I'm $6 an hour. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even pay me. <laughs> you pay me beer. I, mean. <laughs> no, that, I made 500 bucks a week, and I was always uh, owing the drug dealer. <laughs> I, I, I always had to go to the drug dealer when I got it. <laughs> $500 a week is pretty good for back then, huh? Right, that right. And, and they gave me in cash, and then all all of a sudden, I got like the tax form W nine. I was like, "What? <laughs> <laughs> what?" <laughs> so, so tell me all that. That's all in the book, right? It's yeah, in my book. Right? Yeah, that's a hundred percent in my book. Plus, every copy at stevo.com is personally autographed, hands by hand. I autograph every copy, and you can get yourself. And it's a New York Times bestseller. Plus, it's got a average customer rating on Amazon five stars. And your hmm. signature nice. looks like a dick. And my signature looks just like a penis. It's a dickograph. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's Jeff's good. just like what, what, what the you, fuck? Once again, you, once again, you top me there. I don't. I don't have anything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. He's like, man, we had some stuff in common. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah, gonna have you meet my, my kids, but <laughs> yeah. my signature looks like a vagina. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Oh man, that's great, dude. So, how long is this special that that comes out? tomorrow well uh it's uh you know a typical 44 minutes uh, it's an, an hour special but you know once you get through with uh, sure commercial uh, breaks 44 minutes yeah and we you know uh, my live show is usually two hours and wow. this thing i i had again i had no earthly idea how long anything was and i'm like how can i time this with only 100 people because with the bigger ones you time you know my timing is different because the laughs would be longer and mm -hmm. i knew the laughs were going to be much shorter with 100 people in there so you know, I wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and uh, uh, came up with, you know, it's, nobody cares. But a, two hours of me talking is about 10,000 words. Wow. And so, yeah. And so this special was about 11,000 words. And I ended up doing an hour and 20 minutes. So obviously the laughs were much shorter. But then we edited it down to that. And we're just we're in the final edit. Like when I uh, finished with you guys, I know today is the day after it's on now. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, so we got to yeah. finish in two hours. So you still are, you're going to deliver it right at the wire. Exactly. We're going to deliver it like, and like when we, uh, we get finished right now, <laughs> Man, <laughs> no, that's... but it's, it's a week out. If you want to talk in real numbers. So what is today? Today is uh, Sunday. Sunday. Today's Sunday. So we deliver it, I think tonight or tomorrow. And it's a, it, it was when I came up with that, this idea was two months ago. So I've never done wow. anything this fast. Yeah. Are you, we, are you stressed we, out? I think I'm more stressed out about the airing than I was the performance because I, you know, one of these things after you've edited it and gone back over and watched it 20 times, it's not funny anymore. You know, right. in every single special I've ever done, this is the 10th one. I sit back and I go, I don't know if this is funny. And everybody around me and my wife goes, no, trust us. It's funny. It's good. Don't worry about it. 
but I, right. I don't. I, yeah, no, I, I think it's funny. It made me laugh the first couple of times I saw it. So, uh, hmm. yeah. How many shows did you do? I mean, I typically you do uh, tape the special a couple of times so that yeah. you can. You we, do always do, we always do two. And uh, we ended up using most of one show. I think that's how it normally goes. Yeah. Yeah. Because for me, it, it literally was the very first night was, you know, it was the first time I'd ever done the jokes. So we went in and, you know, noodled a few jokes and that had a few punch ups. And so the second night I had, you know, maybe 10 percent more jokes and better jokes. And mm. so we used most of that. So I yeah. think that, that it's going to it's going to do great. I think that uh, when, when, when I first heard, oh, Jeff's got a, a new special coming out, I, I my initial reaction was, man, God, how how far in advance have all these networks and streaming platforms been banking these, you know, like it's getting to, I've, I've thought like, I mean, it's getting to the point where it's almost uncomfortable to put out a new special with like a full packed audience because it's so evident that it's so old, but really nice to hear that, that you've done this just three weeks ago with like the full kind of, it's current, you know, it's, it's current. And I think there's going to be a real curiosity as to what it looks like for Jeff Dunham, the arena guy to, film in front of 100 people outdoors in Malibu. Right. And the taste for a long time with comedy special was to not, you know, in the early days of these comedy specials, you always got the audience shots and you could use them for editing. And then they said, no, we don't want any audience shots anymore. So there were a couple specials I did where you didn't see the audience at all. And mm -hmm. watch a lot of comedy specials now. They never do crowd shots. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, we have to show the crowd on this to show everybody in masks, to show what we're in the middle of. It's got to be, and it was as, you know, I tried to make it as down home and charming as possible. It's outside, um, uh, you know, and so I, you know, and I think it worked out. And, um, you know, nobody, uh, nobody, I don't think anybody expected it to do as, as well, for it to go as well as it did. So, uh, and also it's the first time in a long time I've done something that's PG and not PG-13 or R. There's, uh, you know, there was only two F-bombs in there, and those were bleeped, of course, for Comedy Central, but those were ad-libs when I was messing with the crowd. Otherwise, it's completely family-friendly. The subject matter is okay. And I wanted to do that because of what you just said, Steve. Oh, everybody's sitting around. Uh, it, it's, I think it's the perfect time uh, for families to get together and be able to watch something. Because, you know, you know what's doing the big numbers on TV right now are the freaking Disney sing-alongs. You want to shoot yourself in the head, but that's what everybody's watching, <laughs> yeah. you know? That's what people love. And so I thought I can come up with something that grandma and the kids can sit down and watch together and not have to explain too much. Yeah. Well, that's great, man. That's yeah, super good. Yeah. And I'm glad that we were able to pull this together. Thank you for uh, jumping on this with such short notice. I, I, no, I appreciate you guys uh, having me on. And uh, it's a pleasure. I, I mean, I, I, you know, somebody like you, I really respect you guys. <laughs> You're nuts, dude, and I love it. It's, uh, congratulations. <laughs> well, hey, I appreciate that a lot, man. It's a high honor, and I really do feel that uh, th that I, I relate to you in, in multiple ways. You know, I think that uh, we're, we're kindred spirits, and, and I'm a fan, and it's been a real honor to have you on. Well, that's a, a compliment. I, I appreciate it. Same here. And I look forward to coming to see the RV sometime. You come see my Airstream. <laughs> yeah, dude. That's but, cool. Uh, yeah, we'd love to hit up that uh, Malibu Beach RV park, even though... I don't know if, uh, if I want to go. We'll, we'll find some other place. <laughs> uh, we'll find right. some other place. Meet you at County Line. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever surf? No, no, I am the least athletic guy on the freaking planet. I, I, I got to, you know, I just, no, oh, man. I'm like, no, no. No. <laughs> what, what, what there's a reason, there's a reason in junior high and high school that for my side job, I became a DJ. You know why? Because I couldn't dance and I didn't want to dance. So I just spun the damn records. Great. I love it, man. Well, yeah, it would, it would be great to get together with our, our recreational vehicles and have a good old time, man. And, and, awesome. and, and celebrate the smashing success of your new special. What's the title of it? Oh, the name of the special, I, I, I would lay at night and try and memorize it, but I never got it down. It's Jeff Dunham's completely unrehearsed last minute pandemic holiday special. <laughs> nice. That's brilliant. That's great. Wow, dude, that's <laughs> bold. Sums it up right there. Yeah. yeah I, I came up with that title and, I, and everybody laughed and I said, let's ask Comedy Central what they think. And, you know, as a joke, and they came back and said, we love it. <laughs> wow. Yeah, great. Super cool, yeah. man. I think that, that you, you've got enough of a body of work that people can trust you that it's going to be great, man. I can't wait to see it. Appreciate uh, it. 
Cool, man. Right on, brother. Steve-O, Scott, Paul, and Wendy. Thanks for the time, you guys. <laughs> wow, what a great <laughs> memory. Sure, Pleasure. Yeah, dude. Is that guy just playing cool or what, man? I'm telling you, really fell in love with Jeff Dunham. And I hope you did, too. If you did, go ahead and let him know, man. Just post something on Instagram. Tag him. Just uh, let him know that that was super cool. You know what? You're super cool, too, man. I always appreciate the people who stick around to the very end. And, uh, yeah, I just need you to know that. I love you. And thank you. Hope you're having a good Thanksgiving. Yeah, dude.